Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at chapter 34 from book 4 of De Bello Gallico. So remember at this point we're in the middle of the Gallic Wars and Caesar has made his expedition to Britain. They got stuck there, they dealt with storms, the, the British attacking them on the beach, all these different things. And Caesar is basically stuck for the winter because he can't get off the island, right? He's sent out to get ships, they try to repair some but they're stuck. Now, he had made a peace treaty, right, with the British tribes. The Romans have a fort. They're running out of food. And in the previous chapters, we've seen that the British are basically trying to starve them out. They're going to start attacking their, um, their foraging parties, harassing them, but they're not going to engage in a set battle yet. And they're hoping that the Romans will starve. So that's kind of where we pick up the narrative in chapter 34. You might remember in chapter 33, we saw that the Romans were attacked um, in 32 and 33. The Romans had been attacked by one, uh, by the British tribes, right? The foraging party. And in 33, we had a big description of how the British fight, right? The whole chapter on their chariot, um, their war chariots and that style of fighting. Okay, so the Romans are in a tough spot. And that's where we pick up the narrative now as Caesar has collected some units. You remember in the previous chapters, he collected some units and he's marching out to meet um, the British tribes and save his cut off soldiers uh, personally. Okay. So before we dive into the translation, the thing I always tell you um, in these videos, you want to start by making a vocab list or finding them. They're out there, right? They're not too hard to find um, basically because this is the AP curriculum. There's a lot of them. So you want to memorize the vocab just because it's so hard to understand what's going on if you don't know what the words mean. So always start there. The second thing you want to do is do some pre-reading, right? Of the grammar, you can find a commentary, anything that'll kind of help you out. It's always a good idea. Then you want to read this aloud. I know if you're uh, taking AP Latin, it's, it's tough, right? Time is condensed, but if you can read it aloud, and have a classmate read it back to you. That way you work on your speaking, your pronunciation skills, and your listening all at the same time. All those things will help you actually learn the Latin and read it instead of sort of the mad rush we have in AP to just translate, 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 which might um, miss some details, right? You might get it, but you're not necessarily understanding the language as well. So I'd always encourage you to do that. And when it comes time for translation, use the read and reread method. I say it in all my videos, but it works, right? You read through the story, you write down any problem areas you have. When you're done with this chapter, you look at your list. If it's vocab, very easy, look up the words, right? Memorize them, you'll be okay. If it's grammar, it can be trickier, but this is where commentaries will help. So find any commentary, there's a bunch out there um, on this section, or on the Gallic Wars, rather, on this chapter in particular, and it'll help you through the grammar. And you kind of piece that all together, go back, and you just do this process over and over again until you're able to read through this chapter without needing any help and getting the vast majority of it. It might not be perfect, but it's close to perfect perfect as you can without needing any help. Um, that's how you know you're on the right track, right? That's the sign that you're ready to move on. Otherwise, you're going to just be translating. And you're probably going to forget it, which again, if you're taking this for AP Latin is not great for the test. But even if you're taking this just for fun to understand it, you don't want to forget what you read um, or translated, you know, a week later. So this will kind of lock in your long term memory but, uh, more, right? So <clears throat> if at this point you haven't done that, pause the video, go back and do it, right? Um, you should use the rest of the video as sort of a double check just to make sure you're on the right track um, to give you some guidance, not that my translation are ever perfect, like I always tell you, but it should be enough to kind of help you um, feel like you're on the right track and explain some things to you. Okay, so let's dive in um, and kind of work our way through. And like I said, hopefully it'll just be a, a nice little double check so that you can feel comfortable that you're on the right track. So chapter 34 starts like this. You have quibus rebus perturbatis nostris novitate pugnae tempore opportunissimo caesar auxilium tulet. Namque eos adventu hostes constiterunt nostri se ex timore reciperunt. Okay, <clears throat> so we have a longer sentence here, and the first thing you're going to see in our, our sort of color coding that I use, the purple is ablative. It's just a string of different uses of the ablative. Okay, so it's a little bit of a, of a tricky line to unpack. The main um, phrase here, right, the main subject and verb is at the end, right, of the first part. You have Caesar auxilium tulit, which is a straightforward line, right? Caesar brought help, which we know is what uh, he's doing. Okay, but at the beginning you have quibus rebus, right? This is the ablative of cause, just to separate these out so you can kind of piece together all the ablatives. So because of these things, right, on um, the chariot uh, attack, right, he described, um, you know, the ambush, because of all that, okay, um, and the style of fighting, nostris perturbatis is the ablative absolute, right? So our men, nostris, our men having been thrown into confusion, okay? So whenever you see nostris, our, he's talking about his soldiers, okay? So they were perturbatis, right? They were thrown into confusion. They're, they're confused at what's happening here, okay? Then you have the noitate pugnae. Okay, 
<clears throat> so the noitata is best translated as like newness. It's just an ablative of means if you're keeping track. Not that you necessarily need to dive on that too far into different ablative uses, but it's going with perturbatis, right? So what were they thrown into confusion by? By the noitate pugna, by the newness of the fighting or the novelty of the fighting. And what he's referencing here is that style of chariot fighting, right? The war chariots and jumping onto the yoke, all these things. Okay. Then you have tempore opportunissimo at that time, right? At that most suitable time, Caesar brought help. So Caesar arrives just in a nick of time is kind of the idea. Okay. Then you have namque eus. So for um, at his arrival, right? Adwentu eus. At his arrival, um, the enemy halted. Hostes constiterum. Right. So they um, literally like stood still or halted, however you want to do that. Right. The temporary opportunissimo is an ablative of time. Right. With a superlative. So, again, there's three, four different uses of the ablative in that first part. Um, so it's just getting a little uh, confusing. So that's the at this time, you know, this opportune time. And now at his arrival. Right. The odd went to um, they stood still. They halted. Right. And our men, Nostri, our men, recaparent, they recovered themselves. Um, say recaparent is sort of an idiom that um, Caesar likes to use. Sometimes he means like uh, retreated, but recovered themselves is probably a good way to do it because it's talking about the timo, uh, timore, right, from fear. So they recovered themselves from fear. So in other words, because of all this stuff, the chariot, ra- uh, chariot fighting, not racing, the chariot fighting, the newness of it, the, the men were all confused. Caesar shows up at the exact perfect time. And notice how he tells you that, right? A little bit of bragging. He shows up and when he arrives, the enemy stop, right? And it gives his men a chance to recover and get back on track, okay? Then you go to the next one. You have quo facto, ad lacessendum, hostum et comitendum proelium alia, alienum, rather, esse tempus arbitratus, suo se loco continuet et brevi tempore intermiso in castro legiones reduxe. Okay, so quo facto is an ablative absolute. So he starts by saying, um, which having been done is kind of one way to do it, right? Quo facto, you can even say like this having been done, um, going with the quote. So with this having been done, meaning he showed up, right? You have um, uh, Caesar, right? Arbitratus. Here you have at the sort of middle of this line, you have a perfect passive participle. It's deponent, okay? So Caesar having judged, and it sets up this big indirect um, statement because he's thinking, right? He's judging, but we don't have a quote. So having judged that, you could say, tempus esse, the time was alienum, unfavorable is, is one way I've seen this translated, right? You don't want to say like foreign. I don't think that really makes a ton of sense in English saying the time was foreign. So go with unfavorable, right? The time was unfavorable. And then you have these odd plus gerundives here, right? Odd la cassendum rather and comitendum. Okay, so when you do this, what it's doing um, is it's just saying, uh, uh, you know, it, it's showing sort of like a purpose, right? Odd plus a gerundive. So you could say four is probably your best um, translation here. So he judged, right, having judged that the time was unfavorable, uh, unfavorable rather, for la cassendum hostem, for provoking the enemy, right? Translate the gerundive just with ing, it's going with hostem. So for provoking the enemy, and comitendum commencing proelium battle, right? So you have two um, gerundives going with that, that sort of accusative there, okay? So Caesar shows up and having judged that it was a bad time, right? It was not the right time for provoking the enemy and commencing or sort of recommencing um, the battle. What does he do? He continue it. There's your main verb, right? Say continue it. He held himself suo loco in his own position, okay? So this is a fun way of saying he basically stood his ground, right? Um, but uh, literally, it says something like he held himself in his position, right? He held his ground is, is our, our translation. So Caesar shows up, the enemy stop, and instead of attacking them, or as he says, la cassendum host and provoking them, he holds his ground, right? He stops and he's like, hey, if you want to come fight, come fight. OK, and remember, this is actually a good strategy because the British are not necessarily trying to have a full on fight with him. They're trying to kind of pick at the edges and get his foraging parties. So Caesar holds his ground, reorganizes. Right. And it, it kind of gives the, the British tribes pause. OK, so he held his ground and brevi tempore intermiso. Right. Um, uh, with the the or, or sorry, in a short time interrupting. Right. With a short time intermiso kind of interrupting everything um, um, is one way to do it. Right. He reduces it. He led back his legiones, his legions in Castra into camp. 
right? So with that short time inter, right, intermittent, right, intermiso, think of like an intermission, right? So they basically hold there for a short time, then he brings the legions back, okay? So if you're envisioning what's going on, they basically make a battle formation, right? They stand their ground, they're waiting, the British don't do anything, so he goes back into camp, okay? So Caesar saves the day is kind of um, kind of the idea here. Okay. Then we go on to the next line. You have Dum haec geruntur, nostris omnibus occupatis qui erant in agris reliqui discesserunt. Okay. So while these things geruntur were happening, right, is kind of one way to, to translate. So while these things are going on or are happening, with all our men, omnibus nostris, with all our men occupatis, um, occupied, right, um, the reliqui, the rest, qui erant in agris, who were in the fields, um, discaser, they departed. So here he's talking about the British, right? Not the Romans. So remember, they were waiting in the fields, waiting to ambush them. So all the ones who didn't actually attack the British, they all go back. That's the reliquy. Okay, so everything's going on. The, the Romans are all engaged. They're trying to, you know, Caesar's reorganizing and all the rest of the British tribes, they leave, right? So they're, they're off and running. He's going to tell you what they do now. Okay. So you have secutae sunt, continuos, complures dies tempestates, quae et nostros in castris continerent, et hostem a pugna prohiberent. Okay. So secutae sunt. So uh, it followed, right? It's just um, a, a deponent, right? So something followed, and the something is tempestates, storms. Okay. So storms followed, um, it's just perfect tense, for uh, very many continuous days, right? Continuos complores dies. It's the accusative of, of duration of time. So for very many days, and not just many days, but continuous days, right? So a string of storms um, are happening. You have the storms coming, okay? And there's storms which, quai, um, they both uh, continerent, contained, right? So the storms contained, um, uh, nostros, our, our men in castries, right? So they contained our uh, our men in our camp. And they prohibited, they prohibited the hostem, the enemy, a pugna from battle, okay? So this is kind of an interesting um, situation where the storms come, right, for a lot of days. And it means that the Romans can't get out, which is kind of good because they just got attacked, but also kind of bad because they're running out of food, right? So they can't get out of camp, but it also prevents the British from attacking them, right? Because there's all these storms. So it's a double-edged sword, some good things, some bad things, but the storms, which we've seen before, pop up again, right? And they kind of keep everyone in place, okay? Then you continue, you have interim barbari, nuntios in omnes partes dimiserant, paucitatem, uh, Pavita temque, rather, nostro militum suis, praedica verant, et quanta praedae faciendae atque in perpetuum sui liberandi facultas daretur si Romanos castris expulisent demonstra verant. Okay, so we have this long line. So you have the storms keeping everyone in camp, right? Nobody's doing anything. So intera, meanwhile, right, while these storms are happening, the barbari, the barbarians, right, the British tribes, they demiser, they sent out nuntios, messengers, in omnes partes, into all parts, right, into all directions is kind of one way to do it. So they sent out a bunch bunch of messengers, right? Why did they do this? Praedicawera. They proclaimed suis to their own, to their own people, right? The messengers went out and proclaimed the paucitatem, the scarcity nostrorum militum of our soldiers okay so they send out these messengers and they pro they proclaim to everyone right to their own soldiers the paucitatum right the scarcity of our soldiers it's saying that the romans don't have a lot so the british send out messengers and they're they're saying hey look the romans don't have anyone here right which they already know there's only a few um, Roman soldiers there. So not only that, but they're proclaiming how scarce the Romans are and how great, right, um, uh, quanta, and, and it's it's going with facultas, an opportunity, right? So how great an opportunity, pridae faciendae, of making spoils, right? Meaning like um, uh, the spoils of war. So there's an opportunity uh, for the spoils of war here. So this is all an indirect, quash, uh, indirect question, rather, and it's going to be governed at the end by demonstrawera, right? They showed. So they send out these uh, messengers to their people, um, and you have uh, the pride faciendi is, a, is the gerund, right? So you translate, it's a gerunda, rather. You translate it just like it's a, a gerund. So it's this um, a, a freeing spoils or, or getting spoils, this opportunity of getting spoils, and in perpetuum, right? In perpetuity, forever is really what it means, of liberandi sui, of freeing themselves. So they're, they're saying, hey, you know, we, they, the Romans don't have anyone here, right? They have the scarcity of soldiers. And we have this great opportunity for getting spoils of war, the pradi, and forever liberating ourselves, 
Okay, and it's saying that the fa- uh, how great an opportunity the quanta facultas daretor was given, right? So they're saying, look how great of an opportunity we've been given. Okay, and they say we can do this. Si Romanos castris expulisent if they expelled the Rom- the Romanos the Romans from their camp ex castris. Right, you don't need the extra uh, ex there, but that's what it's doing from camp. So if we can drive them out, we have this great opportunity, and it's all hinging on demonstrawera. Right, they showed. So they sent out the. Uh, there's three kind of verbs here of what the British are doing. They sent out messengers dimis out. They proclaim predicawera, right, that these things are going great. And they demonstrawera, they showed that we can do this, right? So the messengers are telling all the British tribes, look, we have a great opportunity here. We have the Romans on the on the run, right, on the ropes, and we can get rid of them if we just kind of um, attack them now and drive them out of their camp, okay? And then you have the last line to end the chapter. You have his rebus celeriter magna multitudine peditatus equitatus que coacta ad castra venerant, Okay. So we start with his rebus again, right? Because of these things or, or on account of these things, you might say, right? It's just the ablative of cause. So because of these things, right? Um, the Wenerant, right? They came, meaning all the British tribes, they came Keleriter quickly with a magna multitude, uh, magna multitudine rather, with a great multitude of peditatus equitatus, right? Of infantry and cavalry. So here come the reinforcements for the British, right? They hear all these things, they get get it. They're like, okay, this is a great opportunity. And they show up with another big release force. Okay. And it's the release force coacta having been collected, right? So they, they came odd. So the main verb, uh, main sentence or main part of the sentence, the main clause to backtrack is they came odd costra. They came quickly to the camp with a great multitude coacta having been collected, right? So there's an ablative absolute happening there with a great multitude of, of, you know, cavalry and infantry having been collected, they came quickly to the camp. Remember the ablative absolute happens first. So they get all these soldiers, they're ready to go, and now they're going to regroup and attack the Romans, okay? So this is an interesting part of the narrative where the Romans are now going to get attacked by a um, a full-on British force, right? The, The British are coming in force to wipe them out, okay? So, some questions to think about because that, that narrative is, is interesting. At the beginning, right, there's something kind of interesting happening at the very start of this chapter. The pacing is, is really, really um, something to think about, at least I think. So by using all those ablatives, right, Caesar started with just this, this string of ablatives, ablative absolutes, all these things. It makes the pacing feel fast, right? So he's saying our men are overwhelmed. All these things are happening. They don't know how to fight, right? And then Caesar showed up, Caesar Exilium Tulit, right? He brought help. So there's this intensity, this heightened intensity of using those, those ablatives in quick succession, right? And then there's sort of a calming effect when he shows up. So in that first line, when Caesar shows up and it says Caesar brought help, the simplicity of that line kind of shuts down all the chaos of the ablatives in front of it. So if you look at that first line again, there's sort of a quick string of ablatives, the intensity is heightened, and then Caesar comes and it calms everything down. And the end of that line, right, um, is sort of calm as well. It's very straightforward. The enemy stopped because of his advance and our men caught their breath, right? They, they um, retreated from fear, kind of brought themselves back from fear. So this is a good example of how you can heighten and create sort of an emotional impact by the use of language. And Caesar's very good at this, right? So by, by um, kind of setting it up this way, um, by choosing sort of rapid fire, ablative absolutes, things like that. He heightens the intensity and then just straight indicative verbs, he calms it down. And it makes it feel like Caesar is the calming effect, okay? And you can see that in his description, right, of how he showed up and everyone calmed down. So he's always a calming presence on the battlefield, which he was a great leader. We know that he's a very good general. His men loved him. This is what happens when Caesar shows up. Everything calms down. And it's uh, interesting to see that he's leading from the front, too, right? Caesar didn't send someone else to save his soldiers. He showed up himself. That's always a great way to inspire your men. And Caesar's smart. He knows that it's going to be a bigger impact if he shows up as opposed to one of his generals. You can also see a little bit into Caesar's tactical mind in this chapter, right? His, his, his way of thinking as a general, which is excellent, right? But he tells you that he judged the situation to be the wrong time for a fight, which is true, right? He doesn't attack them. Um, it might not have gone well. He realizes this is an ambush, but that's something that's interesting to see, right? He's showing you how good of a general he is, and he always tells you, right, when he makes a, a right decision. But you can see, and notice how he says at the most opportune time I showed up and I judged it was, you know, not the right time to attack. But it is true. He's very good on the battlefield. 
Um, and he's always kind of good at judging when the situation is going to go wrong. Um, not that he's perfect, but you get a little glimpse of that here, which is good. The other thing I like about this chapter is the storms are back, right? These storms, he can't get rid of them. The stormy English channel keeps kind of rearing its ugly head. So you want to think about if they're helping or hindering Caesar here. And I would say it's both, right? They do pause the British from attacking. But the pause also gives the British time to get more troops. They allow Caesar to heal up his men, but it also means they can't forage for food, right? Um, and the other thing is, remember, Caesar had sent out ships to bring relief from the mainland. They're not going to show up with the storm. So the storms are this sort of double-edged sword always in this narrative. Um, and you want to see when they pop up and kind of how they impact things, right? Because he's just in a very stormy area. Um, the other thing I highlighted here that I think is interesting, Caesar uses the phrase in perpetuum sui liberandi when he's talking about how the British are thinking and how the, the messengers convince um, the British tribes to come attack the Romans. So he says that they, they say that they're going to be able to kind of achieve this opportunity for freeing themselves uh, in perpetuity, right? Forever, which is an interesting phrase. And you want to think about what he meant by this, right? It, it's interesting um, wording because are the British free at this point? Are they subject to the Romans? Like it, it kind of makes you question what's going on here and why you think Caesar said this. Um, yes, the Romans made a peace treaty, but I wouldn't say the, the, the Britons are their vassals by any stretch of the imagination, right? The Romans have only landed um, on the coast. They haven't done anything, right? They haven't conquered the British. So you want to think about why he says this. You'll be able to have your freedom forever. Why do you think he might have said this? Well, I think it kind of hints at the future where the Romans will show up and, and attack again, right? Caesar will attack again. So there is a little hindsight involved, but it also makes it seem like a good justification, right? In terms of the narrative, if the British are fighting for their, their freedom, right? It, it does kind of add to something. Um, maybe the British really thought that if they don't stop the Romans now, they'll never stop coming. I don't know, but it is an interesting way of describing it because I wouldn't say in any stretch of the imagination that the British are subject to the Romans here, but Caesar makes it feel that way uh, with the way he, um, you know, he uses this wording. Okay. The last thing to think about the British strategy. Strategy. Remember, their strategy was not to full on attack the Romans, but to harass their foraging parties. How did this change everything, right? How did this encounter change? I would say this is a turning point and you can see it. They're not just kind of harassing anymore. Now they know for certain that the Romans are very weak. They don't have a lot of troops and now they're bringing a big release force, um, relief force rather. And you can see the British strategy changing. So just an interesting thing to think about as we follow the narrative in book four. OK, if you have any questions at all on the, the translation, the grammar, anything, just put them in the comments below. I'm happy to help. But otherwise, keep at it. Keep practicing. Keep thinking about what you're reading. Right. Try to understand why Caesar's telling you this stuff um, and enjoy the narrative as you go. Right. And if you need anything, let me know. But just keep at it. Keep practicing and it should get easier. Good luck.